Well, some very practical and yet very difficult teaching from Jesus uh, here this morning. Uh, he's talking about relationships, uh, specifically difficult relationships. And uh, if you're alive, you probably have some of those in your life, some people that are difficult to deal with. And that's what Jesus is kind of addressing for us this morning. And as you think about that, it's like, man, what do we do with those people? What do you do with difficult people uh, in your life? What do you do with the boss who always seems to have it in with you? The coworker or the employee that always disappoints you? What do you do with the roommate who just never gets like her junk out of the way and you're always, you know, in an argument about it? What do you do about the boyfriend that cheats on you? What do you do about the spouse that seems to be withdrawing from you? The relative that you haven't spoken to in years and years, the, 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 the neighbor that gossips about you, the, the person you thought was your friend, but then they stab you in the back. What do you do about that person? Our first instinct is like, get them back, right? Like I can make you, you feel the pain too. Uh, ask our kids, we have three kids and they're, they're eight, five, and two. And the, boy, the two boys are the oldest. The girl uh, is, the, is the little one, the young one. And I, always, I say to the boys, okay, boys, what are you gonna do if someone ever tries to date your little sister and they immediately say, we will dominate him. <laughs> and I love that. And so I'm not gonna let them read this part of the Bible for <laughs> quite some time. They won't be mature enough for this teaching yet. It's a little more advanced. But that's our deal, right? Like we wanna get people back. And, and if you've been wounded, if you've been hurt uh, by someone else, like you want them to feel as much or more pain than they have made you feel. That's what we want. And especially as Americans, like we know what it is to insist upon our rights. We insist upon our privileges and, 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 and we have court systems that, that, that enact that and all that kind of stuff. Well, it was the same thing going on in Jesus' day. People were like, I'm going to get you back. So that's what Jesus says in verse 38. You've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you. So Jesus says, you've heard eye for eye, tooth for tooth, but I'm telling you something different. Now, wait a minute. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth comes from the Bible. That comes, in fact, it's three times in the Old Testament, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. So are you saying, is Jesus saying, I disagree with the Old Testament? Is Jesus himself disagreeing with the Bible? No, he already told us in verse 17, like he came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. So what's going on here? He's correcting their misinterpretation, their misapplication, because they're using like individually, like you knock out my tooth, I'm gonna knock out your tooth, I'm gonna come get you. But Jesus is saying, you totally misinterpreted. Eye for an eye was never intended that way. Eye for an eye was intended to bring justice and mercy uh, into society. And in fact, uh, when God gave the Jews that law and then they started enacting society, this was like a huge judicial advancement, a huge advance in like the ancient justice system. And it did three things and, and you're gonna find them fairly familiar. The first thing it did was it enacted equality. So an eye for an eye brings e e equality. It says everybody is equal. Just like we saw two weeks ago with Jesus teaching on divorce, Jesus teaching on divorce was intended to protect vulnerable women from the whims of powerful men. And eye for an eye was intended to protect vulnerable people from the whims of powerful people. Because in that day, like if you were stronger, you could just take what you wanted. If you were richer, you could just take what you wanted. And this is saying, no, it's only a tooth for a tooth. No more than that. It's, put, it's placing a limit. And so it's saying, I don't care how poor you are. I don't care what race you come from. I don't care uh, what your background is. You cannot be exploited. So it enacted equal justice under the law. And then it brought objectivity. So this whole idea was, like, if you go back and look at the Old Testament passages, it's not given to individuals to take an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. It's given to the judges, given to the courts. It's saying individuals can't do this. Only the court can do this. Only the judge can do this. And therefore it brought objectivity. You couldn't go out and take personal revenge. And there had to be at least two witnesses for this. And therefore it ended revenge. Because it said only the civil authorities, only the courts could do this. So there's no revenge. There's no me getting what's mine. It ended revenge as well because it, it says basically what? The punishment must fit the crime. Now, we're not used to this because like in old cultures, in these cultures, it was an honor-shame culture. And so it was like, if someone knocked out your tooth, you knock them out my tooth, I cut off your arm. You kill my cow, I kill your kids. You burn my field, I burn your house. Like, that's how it was. And what this is saying is, no, the punishment has to fit the crime. It can't exceed that. You can't just take more and more and more and get your own personal revenge. It brought justice and equality. In fact, you can see these things. These are the pillars upon which our own justice system was built upon, right? 
equal justice under the law. So Jesus says, all right, how do you deal with these people? If this is intended to bring justice and mercy, people aren't doing it. How do you deal with these, the boss, the spouse, the relative, the neighbor? How do you do it? And Jesus says, we do it through forgiveness. Verse 39. Verse 39, he says, uh, I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. You say, what do you mean, Jesus, don't resist the one who is evil? So if I'm in an abusive situation, I just have to sit there and not resist? I just have to sit there and take it? No, that's not what he's teaching at all. In fact, there's several uh, instances in the Gospels. John 6 is one of those where you see Jesus who's in a, a situation where things are about to go down. It's about to get crazy. It's about to be violent. And Jesus withdraws from that situation. He removes himself from that situation. So if you're in an abusive situation, you need to extract yourself from that. And there are people in our church that will help you to do that. It's not what Jesus is saying. What he's saying is do not return evil for evil. Do not return violence for violence. Don't pay people back and Paul says the same thing in Romans 12. He says, don't repay evil for evil, but overcome evil with good. So when people wrong you, you don't pay them back, you forgive them. Why? Because forgiveness brings freedom. You're like, I don't want to forgive people. But listen, forgiveness brings freedom. Bitterness and resentment and revenge is a prison. But yet, maybe three of the hardest words you and I will ever say to anyone is, I forgive you. I forgive you. It's easy to kind of brush over things and say, well, it's okay, or I'll get over it, or thank you, or whatever. But like to actually look someone in the eye and say, I forgive you, it's a hard thing to say. And yet Jesus is calling us to even more than that, to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. Famous atheist Bertrand Russell, you might know of him, wrote and talked a lot in the early 1900s. This is what he said. He said, love your enemies is good. There's nothing to be said against it except that is too difficult for anybody to practice. It, it, it sounds good, right? But it's just too difficult for us actually to do. But here's what, I don't think he got the principle that there is a freedom that comes with forgiveness. It's like a get out of jail card, but it's not free, but it's get out of jail. And, and there's a couple different kinds of forgiveness that come here. And the first one I want to talk about is really like a passive forgiveness. Verse 39, don't resist the one who is evil. A passive forgiveness is forgiving the person who isn't asking for it. There are a lot of people who do some crazy stuff, a lot of people who have wounded you and wronged you, and they've never cared. You've gone to them, maybe you've told them, you've tried to keep them accountable, you've tried to do it, but they didn't care. They didn't acknowledge it. They didn't, they didn't repent for that. They didn't, they didn't come and say, uh, will you forgive me? And Jesus says, yet, there's a freedom in forgiving even them. Now, freedom is not the same thing as reconciliation. We hope for reconciliation, we have to forgive. See, you can forgive the boyfriend that cheated on you without immediately jumping back into their arms, right? Not, freedom, uh, forgiveness is not the same as reconciliation. You can forgive the business partner who stole from you without immediately opening your checking account back up to the person. You can forgive them without necessarily reconciling. That's why Paul says, uh, live at peace with everyone as much as it depends on you. So up to, your, up to what depends on you, you live at peace with others. Somebody once said that, uh, you know, we hold bitterness and resentment, that holding bitterness and resentment inside of us is like taking poison and expecting the other person to die. It's like we're going to ingest poison and then I'm hoping that that person dies. That's what bitterness and resentment, is. it's a poison uh, inside. You say, well, I know that person wronged me. I, maybe I should forgive them, but I don't feel like forgiving them. I don't feel like it. Of course you don't feel like it. They just, you know, they just totally wronged you. Here's the deal. Forgiveness is first a choice and then it's an emotion. It's a choice first and then it's an emotion. You're not going to feel like forgiving someone that totally jacked you. So you're going to have to choose daily in Christ to forgive. I forgive you today. Okay, the next, so if it's really bad, like you'll have to forgive tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day and the next day. Eventually, the choice of forgiveness will lead to the heart of forgiveness and the emotion of forgiveness. And you will begin to see that. If you choose the opposite, you say, well, I'm going to get revenge. I'm going to retaliate. I'm going to have bitterness, resentment, whatever. I'm going to hope that person's worse. I'm going to root against them. If you do that, that's putting you on an escalator of pain. Revenge and bitterness is just an escalator of pain. And there's no stop. It just goes up and up and up and up. And it just, it, it just keeps carrying you higher and higher to more, more bitterness, more pain, uh, more resentment. That's what it does. And it starts to control you. And you start to be controlled by your past. Uh, I experienced this uh, several years ago, like 10 years ago. I had a guy who was, uh, he was 
uh, my mentor. He was a fellow pastor. He was a really good friend. And uh, he just utterly betrayed me. And he ended up lying about it and obfuscating and not, wouldn't meet, wouldn't talk, wouldn't do anything. And it just really, it's really hurt me. And I, I, over time, I thought, like, after a couple years, like, I've, I've forgiven him. Uh, but, but then I heard a rumor several years, like three, four years later, and, and, and he lives in a whole different state and all that stuff. But I heard a rumor that, uh, that someone in his congregation had betrayed him. And it had split the church, and like 40% of his church had left over this betrayal. And there was a little emotion and like a smile came on my face. And I thought to myself, just what he deserves. Just what you deserve. I really hadn't forgiven him. And then... The next thing that came to me is, Jeremy, did Jesus give you what you deserve? And yet you think you know what everybody else deserves. The truth was, I had to work through that. It was a passive, he wasn't asking for it, but I had to work through it. I had to forgive. And later on, a couple years later, something really good happened in his life, and I was able to celebrate that internally because God does that kind of work. But see, the, 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 the problem is, is that was controlling me. It was an escalator of pain. That, that was, and in fact, uh, you know, I, I didn't want to take on other mentors in my life because I didn't want them to do what he had done, and I didn't want to, you know, face that deal. It was my past was controlling me. How do you change your past? You can't change your past, right? Nobody can change your past for you. You can't change your past, but you can change the way you deal with your past. You can change the way your past controls you, the way you interact with your past. That can be changed. So what is it? Who is it in your past that just sticks with you? You feel that sense it's controlling me. It, it changes my emotion. Who or where or what in your past is, is controlling you. How do you get over that? How do you get past that? The only way not to be controlled by your past, especially wrongs done to you in your past, is to forgive in the present. Forgiveness is the only way not to be controlled by your past because it allows you to be free of that. How do you do that? You can't change your past, but you can give your past to God. I love to look at 1 Peter 2 in those situations. 1 Peter 2, G, uh, Peter says about Jesus, when he was reviled... He didn't revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he continued, listen to this, he continued entrusting himself to the one who judges justly. He continued entrusting himself to the one who judges justly. How do you give up your past? How do you give up control of those things? You entrust yourself to the one who judges justly. Lord, I can't judge justly, but you're the just judge. You're the avenger. You're the provider. You're the forgiver. I trust you with this. You say, wait, are you telling me that you believe that God is a just judge, like he's going to come with some kind of judgment? Yes, I do. And you should too. Actually, you should want God to be a God of justice. Why? Because here's the deal, and this is a lot, a, lot, a lot of you struggle with this in Christianity. Like maybe you're skeptical, maybe you're cynical, and you're like, this is my issue with the church. This is my issue with religion. And they talk about a God of judgment, and it brings violence into the world, and, and there can't be peace whenever you're talking like that. I would actually say it's the opposite. Think about it for a minute. See, if there is no God, if there is no God who will one day set all the world to rights, then there's no hope for justice. There are a lot of people who've done a lot of wicked things, and they will get off scot-free. If there's no God, Hitler will never be punished. If there's no God, you will never experience true justice, because the only justice you'll ever have in life is what you can get your own hands on, and it'll never be good enough. It'll never actually satisfy you. But if there is a God who is perfectly loving, per perfectly merciful, perfectly good, perfectly just, and he says, Revelation 21, 5, behold, I am making all things new. In other words, I will one day set all the world to rights and I will right every wrong and I will bring every injustice to perfection. If there is a God who says that, then you and I can say, well, I can let him do that. I can have patience, I can have peace, I can have reconciliation, I can have forgiveness, I can be free from that because God's in charge of it. 
I can be free from it because God will do it. We need a God like that. Nelson Mandela understood that. And if you know anything about Mandela's story, he protested apartheid in South Africa, especially in the 50s and 60s. And he stood up and he was in prison for that. In 1964, he went to prison and he was in prison for 27 years, all for dissenting, all for speaking up. And when he got out of prison, everybody came to him, man, are you, are you ticked? Are you angry? Are you about to go nuts on these guys? Like, what are you going to do? Here's his quote. He said, as I walked out the door toward the gate that would lead to my freedom, I knew if I didn't leave my bitterness and my hatred behind me, I would still be in prison. If I didn't leave it, all the bitterness and hate, hate, hate behind, I would still be in prison. But he recognized there's a freedom that comes with forgiveness. But here's the deal. Jesus makes it even a little tougher. This is not just like forgiving in your heart and your mind. You have to actually actively forgive, not just in word, but in deed. So look at these things. He gives us four illustrations, four applications of this, starting in verse 39. He says, don't resist the one who is evil, but if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other one also. Probably not a verse you're tacking up on your refrigerator. Not my favorite verse in the Bible. So you're saying, okay, so Jeremy, are you saying that if, if someone attacks you, assaults you, and just like, you just got to sit there and take the beat down? Like that's, if someone take, you know, hits you on the right cheek, just give them the other one also? No, that's not exactly what Jesus is talking about. Think a little clo- uh, more closely here. Jesus says, if someone strikes you on what cheek? The right cheek. Why does he specify the right cheek? Well, all the Jews in that day would have been right-handed because they thought that was righteous, which would have been Bad for me because I'm left-handed, but nonetheless, they, it would have all been right-handed. How does a right-handed person strike you on your right cheek? It's a backhand, like this, right? See, it's not so much a fight as an insult. Just getting up in your grill, like just, just, a, just a, a, it's a wounding to your pride. And Jesus is saying, how do you react when people wound your pride, when people insult you, when people get up in your face? And he says, who cares about your pride? Why are you holding on to your pride? Give, it, give, give the rest away too. Turn the other cheek. Illustration one. Illustration two, verse 40. If anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. So in, in the ancient world, your tunic was like your outer garment. Your cloak was your inner garment. It was like your underwear. It was, it was one piece and it was like, uh, like thermal underwear. And every person was entitled to it. Even if you were poor, you had that. Because that's what you would sleep in. That's the only thing you had to keep you warm. Uh, and, and even the courts could not take your, your, your cloak, your inner uh, garment, because it was considered like an inalienable right for you to have that. And Jesus says, well, somebody sues you. By the way, he's not talking about frivolous lawsuits here. They didn't really have that. We have all that going on in our world and we need tort reform and all that kind of stuff. But he's talking about like a legitimate, somebody has a legitimate claim against you. Don't just give them what's owed to them. Give them your cloak. I mean, give them your tune and then give them your cloak, your cloak too. Don't insist on your rights. Give, give it up. So pride and then possessions. Pride in the slapping of the cheek, possessions in your tunic. Then verse 41, illustration three. If anybody forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. What does that mean? Who can force you to go one and why should you go two? And that, okay, so here's the context. In that day, the Romans ruled over the Jews, right? And, and, and it's kind of it's very similar to like what we had in America, pre-revolutionary war. So if you remember your history, like the British soldiers were here in the colonies and they could come up to you and be like, uh, I'm taking your house and it's my headquarters now. I'm taking your house and uh, you're going to house 10 of my officers and you got to feed them and clothe them and give them a place to sleep and stay. They could just do that. They just had that right. And in Jesus' day, the Roman soldiers had a, had a right to walk up to, the, to any Jew and say, you know what, my backpack's heavy, all these weapons I got to carry around, this armor, it's too heavy for me. I'm going to put it on you and you carry it a mile for me. And that was a standard thing. You, you, you carry it one mile. And Jesus says, if they come and ask you to carry it one mile, don't just do that. Carry it two miles. That's where we get that phrase, go the extra mile, right, in customer service. Jesus saying, instead of being bitter and resentful and try to subvert this guy, like, just go, you know what? I'm going to serve you. I won't, I won't just take it the, the minimum. I'll take it an extra mile. Again, your pride. He's the only pride again. So pride, possessions, and then pride. Because if you've got to carry somebody's junk around, like somebody can force you to do that, you just feel like an, like an ox, like a beast of burden rather than uh, an actual human being. And Jesus says, 
All right, it's another chance to deal with your pride. And then the last one, illustration number four, verse 42. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. And he's basically saying, look, give freely, give generously. He's again back to possessions, right? Four illustrations, pride, possessions, pride, possessions. Why does Jesus harp on this? Because if you think about it, what is probably the one thing that's preventing you from forgiving? Pride. I don't want to forgive because I love my ego. I love my pride. And Jesus is saying, if you can get past that, then you can experience the freedom of forgiveness. And then it becomes a missional forgiveness. Why? Because what all the world looks at and goes, you know what? I got to protect my pride. I got to hoard my possessions. I got to, I can't. And Jesus says, you know what? If the world saw us going, you know what? I don't care about my pride. I don't have to protect my pride. All my, all my security, all my comfort, all my status, all my reputation is in you, Lord. And therefore I can give and I can serve and I can do, I can, I can do all those things because, and the world goes, man, these are totally different values. What do you have? Why, what makes you so free? How has this freed you in this way to do this? It's all Jesus. Now, some of you are looking at this and go, yeah, but man, this sounds kind of weak. Like, I don't know if I can do that. Like, it sounds, turn the other cheek and go the extra mile and give up all your pride. That all sounds weak. Is it weak or is it unleashing true power? What does it take more strength to do? Does it take more strength to go one mile or go two miles? Does it take more strength to not turn the other cheek or to turn the other cheek? It takes more strength to turn the other cheek. It takes more strength to go the extra mile. See, what Jesus is saying is pointing us to like, there's a resource. There's something very powerful that gets unleashed in this kind of freedom, this kind of forgiveness. And it's really the most, I mean, you can ask anybody really, Christian, non-Christian, religious, non-religious, what's the most powerful thing in the world? Just watch any movie, action movie, romance movie, drama, Disney movie. What's the most powerful thing in the world? Love. Almost everybody would tell you the most powerful thing in the world is love. And Jesus is saying that's what's being unleashed here. It's the power of love. Martin Luther King Jr. preached a phenomenal sermon on this passage, and this is what he writes about the power of love. He said, hate multiplies hate. And hate is just as injurious, just as damaging to the person who hates as it is to his victim. Love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend. Love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy to a friend. If you know anything about the civil rights movement and how uh, Martin Luther King went about leading that movement is that everywhere he went, what did he find? Hate. And everywhere he went, what did he meet the hate with? Love. He always found a way to meet hate with love. Why? Because he said that was the love of the gospel. He said that meeting hate with love would bring what he called the double victory. He said, see, we could have won the single victory, the victory of equality, by simply being violent and subversive and doing whatever else we had to do, like, you know, just going at it. We probably could have won equality that way. But he said, we wanted to win the double victory, the gospel victory. We won equality and we won our oppressors. We transformed enemies into friends. Met love, met hate with love. That is what we need. That's what we need in our city right now. We need the freedom of forgiveness and the power of love to meet hate with love. That's what we need to transform our city. That's what you need in your life. That's what you need with that boss, that friend, that, that, that student, that, that coworker, that spouse. You need this kind of love. And Jesus says, you know what the most powerful love is? Love for your enemies. Because anybody can love people that are like them. But love for your enemies is key. That's what Martin Luther King was talking about. Uh, and just exactly what Jesus says in verse 43 and 44. He says, you heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Is that one in the Old Testament? No, that one's not in the Bible. Leviticus 19 says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. They left that little part off because as yourself makes it a lot harder, right? Because if you love your neighbor as yourself, 
The commandment is to love your neighbors with the same degree, to the same level, the same amount of energy and effort and resources and money and thoughtfulness that you love your own self. That's how much you love your neighbor. So, so we'll just admit the, omit the as yourself part. And then they added this part, which isn't anywhere in the Bible, at, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Because what they said was, man, it's hard to love your neighbor, so let's define who our neighbor is. And our neighbor is all the people who look like us and smell like us and vote like us and, 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 and like me. And th- that's my neighbor. Everybody else I don't have to deal with. I can just hate them. I don't have to mess with them. And Jesus says, no, you're actually to love your enemies. Uh, several months ago, I read a phenomenal book, and I would recommend it to, to anybody, but it's called Mission to Nuremberg. And if you remember, Nuremberg was the place where the Nazi war crimes tribunal took place. So all the worst of the worst Nazi uh, uh, leadership, they were tried, the criminal war trial in Nuremberg. And the story is about this pastor from St. Louis named Henry Garricky. And Garricky uh, he was a, a, a Lutheran pastor here, he had German background, and he volunteered when he was 50 years old, he volunteered to go to World War II and be a chaplain for uh, servicemen and women there. And, and he did. And when he was almost done, he spent like two and a half years over there, he was finally going to come home, and it was time for the trials at Nuremberg, and they called him and said, we have another assignment for you. We want you to come be the chaplain to the Nazis on trial in Nuremberg. We want you to come minister the gospel to these men. And he didn't know what to do. He wrestled with it. He prayed about it. After many days of prayer, he really believed God was calling him to this job. And he went, he was like, how am I even going to approach these guys? Like, I mean, are you supposed to walk up? Like, should you scowl at them? Like, what, should you shake their hand? How, eventually he decided to shake their hand. Somebody took a picture of him shaking their hands and it got reproduced in the press here uh, in St. Louis and in America. And people just excoriated him for that. But this is what he wrote about that, loving your enemies. He said, I offered my hand in order that the gospel would not be hindered by any wrong approach that I would make. I was there as a representative of an all-loving father. I recalled also that God loves sinners like me. These men must be told about the Savior bleeding, suffering, and dying on the cross for them. For them? See, a minute ago, we we're like, a God of justice, I don't like that. And now we're like, a God of this kind of radical grace, I don't know if I like that. But Jesus said, love your enemies. Who are your enemies? Who are the difficult people? Jesus gives a very practical word, pray for those who persecute you. It's hard to hate somebody that you're praying for regularly. If you start praying for them, like you start to, your heart just starts to soften. That's what Jesus is saying there. So he says, love your enemies, but not just your enemies. He says, love people that are different than you. Look at verse 46 and 47. If you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? Tax collectors were the traitors and the most immoral people the Jews uh, knew of at the day. And so it's like, yeah, everybody loves people that love them. Verse 47, if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. See, it's a chance. Jesus is saying, listen, you look around and see all these people, they're different than you. They're they're a different age than you maybe. They're a different race than you. They're a different background than you. They dress differently than you. They they vote differently than you. Elections are right around the corner, right? Like they they post things on Facebook that you would never post that are crazy, right? Like they're just different people. And you see them like, man, I don't know if I can hang out with those people. I don't know if maybe they're even part of like the problem in the world. Jesus says, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. If you only love people that like you, if you only love people that that stroke your ego or make you advance in your career or in society or or make you feel more attractive about yourself, whatever, if you only love people like that, well, you're really not loving them. You're literally loving yourself. If you only go on mission trips and help the poor and, and serve people because it makes you feel good about you, you're not really loving them. You're really loving you. Jesus says anybody can have that kind of love. And he said, well, you know, I know lots of, kind of different kinds of people. And yeah, I work with some of them. I went to school with some of them. I'm not, I, we're all, it's all cool, man. We're all, we're all on the same, same page. Jesus is saying there's different than, different, lo, different, passive love is different than active love. It's not enough just to say I don't harm 
this person or these people. It's different to say that than it is to say, I help these people. It's just one thing to say, well, I don't hinder the poor. It's a totally different kind of love to say, I help the poor. It's one kind of love to say, well, I, I, I'm not a racist. Totally different one to say, but I'm working to actively undo racism and injustice. Those are two different kinds of things. Jesus is saying the active love is what he's calling us to. He's saying love the difficult people, the the, the different people, the dirty people. Love even your enemies, the people you can't stand. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Now, how can you do this? How is this? I mean, listen, I... I have enough trouble, if you're like me, I have enough trouble loving my wife and kids and my neighbors, like people who actually like me, much less people who are my enemies. Like how, how can we do this? There's only one way. The only way we can have this kind of freedom of forgiveness and the power of, the, of love is by the motive of grace. Is if we really get grace. You see what he says in verse 45? Pray for those who persecute you so you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and on the unjust. On the just and on the unjust. See, how do you know that you're a son or a daughter who resembles the Father? You forgive wrongs and you love enemies. Why? Because that's what he does, right? You heard what he said? What does he do? He sends sunshine and rain on both the just and the unjust. Whether you're a friend or an enemy, he gives you his sunshine and his rain. And just just pause for a minute and see that word there. He says, he makes not the sun rise, he makes his sun rise. In other words, God is saying, I own the sun. And I use that power to shine down warmth and goodness and blessing upon people, whether they're good or bad or moral or immoral, or whether I think they deserve it or not. I give them the sunshine and I give them the rain. That's his love. It's a love for enemies. And he's saying, do you have that kind of love? He's saying, have you received that kind of love personally? Because you and I were enemies of God. An enemy? Yeah, Colossians 1 says we were hostile in mind and alienated. Ephesians 2 says we were children of wrath. Romans 5 says while we were still sinners, Jesus died for the ungodly. If you put your faith in Christ, you're an adopted enemy. He's saying you prove yourself to be sons of the Father. Do you have that? You know what it is to be adopted by the Father? Say, all my hope and faith and, and, and comfort is in, not in me, not in myself, not in my performance. It's in Jesus. Because he is the one who loves his enemies. You can say, well, that sounds interesting intellectually. But see, it has to get inside. It has to grip you. It has to light your heart on fire. Where is it? Where is it that we really see God forgiving wrongs? And loving enemies. Where is it? It's in Jesus on the cross. The amazing thing about this passage is that Jesus did not simply enact the Sermon on the Mount on us. He embodied it in himself. He didn't just enact it on us. He embodied it in himself. Look at these scriptures. In verse 39, Jesus says to us, do not resist the one who is evil. Don't resist the one in evil. But then he embodies it. And in Acts chapter 8, it says, Like a sheep, Jesus was led to the slaughter. Like a lamb before its shear is silent, he opened not his mouth. He embodied it. In verse 39, he says, If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other also. In the Gospel of Matthew 26, it says, Then they spit in his face. They struck him, and some slapped him. He embodies the Sermon on the Mount. In verse 40, Jesus commands us, If anyone sues you and takes your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. Matthew 27. When they had mocked him, they stripped him of his robe. 
They took his cloak as well. Verse 41, Jesus commands us, if anybody forces you to go one mile, go two. In other words, bear their burden, bear their burden extra. But then John 19 says, Jesus bore our burden on the cross. They took Jesus and he went out bearing his own cross. Going to the place called the place of a skull. In verse 44, he says, pray for those who persecute you. In Luke 23, when Jesus is hanging on the cross, what does he do? He prays. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Jesus doesn't just enact the Sermon on the Mount on us. He embodies it in himself. The center of our faith is the man, man, the God-man Jesus hanging on a cross, forgiving wrongs, dying for his enemies, and praying for his persecutors. And then giving us the power, if we believe in him, to do the same. Jesus didn't just command it, he lived it. And because of Jesus' power, a man like Martin Luther King could look the KKK in the face and say, forgiven and loved. Because of that power, Henry Garrick could look the Nazis in the face and say, forgiven and love. And because of his grace, Jesus could look you and me in the face and say, forgiven and loved. Who do you need to forgive and love? What boss, what spouse, what friend, what relative, what roommate do you need to forgive and love? Jesus looked his darkest enemies in the face. He turned the other cheek, he went the extra mile, and he poured out his love. And by God's grace, if your faith is in him, you and I can do the same. Let's pray. Jesus, we bow before you because you are good, because you didn't just enact the Sermon on the Mount, you embodied it. And so we want to put our faith in you because only in that is their hope, only in you is their salvation, only in you is their righteousness, only in you is their power to forgive wrongs, love our enemies, and experience the freedom of forgiveness, the freedom that we first have in you. Amen.